From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Welcome to the Cube and this special IBM Brocade panel. I'm Lisa Martin, and I'm having a great opportunity here to sit down for the next 20 minutes with three gentlemen. Please welcome Brian Sherman, a distinguished engineer from IBM. Brian, great to have you joining us. Thanks for having me. And Matt Key is here, Flash Systems SME from IBM. Matt, happy Thank Friday. You. Happy Friday, Lisa. Thanks for having us. Oh, our pleasure. And AJ Costamento, solutioneer from Brocade, is here. AJ, welcome. Thanks for having me along. And AJ, we're going to stick with you. IBM and Brocade have had a very long, you said about 22 year strategic yeah. partnership. There's some new news in terms of the evolution of that. Talk to us about what's going on with, with Brocade IBM and what is new in the storage industry. Yeah, so the, the newest thing for us at the moment is that IBM just in uh, mid-October launched our Gen 7 platform. So this is, you know, think about the stresses that are going on in the, um, in the IT environments. This is our attempt to keep pace with, uh, with the performance levels that the IBM teams are now putting into their storage environments, um, the all flash data centers and the new technologies around non-volatile memory express. So um, that's really um, what's driving this along with the desire to say, you know what? People aren't allowed to be in the data center. And so if they can't be in the data center, then the fabrics actually have to be able to figure out what's going on and, and basically provide a lot of the automation pieces. So something we're referring to as the autonomous SAN. And we're going to dig into NVMe over fabrics in a second, but I do want to, AJ, continue with you. In terms of, um, of industries, financial services, healthcare, airlines. Yeah, so. Is the biggest um, users, pretty, the biggest need. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much across the board. So if you look at the Global 2000 as an example, something on the order of about 96, 97% of the Global 2000 make use of of fiber channel environments um, and in portions of their of their world generally tends to be a lot of the high-end financial guys, a lot of the pharmaceutical guys, the automotive, the telcos. Um, you know, it, pretty much if the if the data matters, you know, and it's and it's something that's you know critical, whether we talk about payment card information or healthcare. Uh, environments, you know, data that absolutely has to be retained, has to get there, has to perform. Then it's this combination that we're that we're um, bringing together today around the the new storage elements and and the the uh, functionalities they have there, and then our ability in the in the fabric. So the the concept of a 64 gig, you know, environment uh, to help basically not be the bottleneck in in. Uh, in the application demands. Because one thing I can promise you after 40 years in this industry is that software guys always figure out how to consume all the performance that the hardware guys put on the shelf, right? Every <laughs> single time. Well, there's gauntlet thrown down there. Matt, let's go to you. I want to get IBM's perspective on this. Again, as we said, a 22 year strategic partnership. As we, as we look at things like not being able to get into the data center during these unprecedented times and also the need to be able to, to remove some of those bottlenecks. How does IBM view this? Yeah, so it's certainly a case of raising the bar, right? So we have to, as a, as a vendor, continue to evolve in terms of performance, in terms of capacity, cost density. Uh, escalating simplicity, because uh, it's not just a case of uh, not being able to touch the arrays, but there's fewer people not being able to touch the arrays, right? It's a case where our operational density continues to have to evolve. Uh, being able to raise the bar on the network and be able to still saturate those line rates and be able to provide the, essentially a cost efficiency that gets us to a utilization that, you know, raises the bar from our per capita ratio from not just talking about, you know, 200, 300 terabytes per admin, but going beyond the petabyte scale per admin. And we can't do that unless people have access to the data, right? And we have to provide the resiliency, we have to provide the simplicity of presentation and automation from our side. And then this collaboration that we do with our network brother and like, Bro uh, like Brocade here, continue to stay out of the discussion when it comes to talk about networks and throughput bottlenecks. So we truly appreciate this Gen 7 launch that they're doing. Uh, we're happy to come in and fill that pipe on the flash side for them. Excellent, and Brian, as a distinguished engineer, I'd love to get your perspectives on the evolution of the technology over this 22 year partnership. Oh, th thanks Lisa. And it, it certainly has been a, a longstanding, you know, great relationship, great partnership, all the way from, you know, in, inventing joint things to developing, to testing and, and, and deploying to different technologies through, through, through the course of time. And it, it's been one of those that, you know, where, where we are today, like AJ had talked about, you know, 
being able to sustain what the applications require today in, in this always on type of environment. And as, as Matt said, bringing together the, the density and operational simplicity to make that happen because we have to make it easier from the storage side for operations to be able to manage this volume of data that, that we have coming at us. And, and our, our, our due diligence is to be able to serve the data up as fast as we can and as resilient as we can. And so sticking with you, Brian, that simplicity is key because as we know, as we get more and more advances in, in technology, the IT environment's only becoming more complex. So really truly enabling organizations in any industry to simplify is absolute table stakes. Yeah, it, it definitely is. And that, that's core to, to what we're focused on in how do we make the storage environment simple? You know, it's been one of those through through the years and historically, you know, we've had entry level, us in, in the industry as a whole has had entry level products, mid lane, mid range level products, high end level products. And, and earlier this year, we said enough, enough of that. It's, it's one product portfolio. So it's the same software stack. It's just, okay, you know, small, medium and large in terms of the appliances. That, that, that get delivered. And you know, again, building on what Matt said, you know, from a density perspective where we can have a petabyte of uncompressed, undata reduced storage in a 2U enclosure. So it's it becomes from an overall administration perspective, you know, again, one software stack, one automation stack, one way to do point in time copies, replication. So in, in focusing on how to you know, make that as simple for the operations as we possibly can. I think we'd all take a little bit of that right now. Matt, let's go to you and then AJ to you. Let's talk a little bit more, dig into the IBM storage arrays. I mean, we're, we're talking about advances in flash. We're talking about NVMe as a forcing function for applications to change and evolve with the storage. Matt, give us your thoughts on that. No, we saw we saw a monumental leap in where we take so some simplicity pieces uh, from how we deliver our arrays, but also the, the technology within the arrays. Um, about nine months ago here in February, we launched into the latest generation of, of NAND technology. And with that, following the story of simplicity, one of the pieces that we've been ha happily, essentially negating a value prop is storage level tiering. And be able to say, hey, well, we still support the idea of going down to nearline, nearline SaaS and enterprise disk and different flavors of solid state, whether it's you know tier one short usage to tier zero high performance, high usage, all the way up to storage class memory. While we support those technologies and the automated tiering, this elegance of what we've done as latest generation technology that we launched nine months ago has been able to essentially homogenize the environments to be able to deliver that, that petabyte per rack unit ratio that Brian was mentioning, be able to deliver it over into a, a all tier zero solution that doesn't have to go through woes of, of software managed data reduction or any kind of software managed tiering just to be always fast always uh, essentially available from a 100% data availability guarantee that we offer through a technology called HyperSwap. But it's a, it's really kind of highlighting what we've taken from that simplicity story by going into that extra mile and leading the market in technology refresh. I mean, if you say the words IBM over the Thanksgiving table, you're kind of thinking, oh, big blue, big mainframe, old iron stuff. But it's very happy to see over our distributed systems that we are in fact leading this pack by you know multiple months, not just the fact that hey we could announce sooner, but actually coming to delivering on prem the actual solution itself nine ten months prior to anybody else, and with that gets us into new density flavors, gets us into new uh, efficiency offerings, right? Not just talk about hey I can do this petabyte scale on a couple of rack units, but with the likes of brocade, hey that that actually equates to a terabyte per second in the floor tile. What's that do for your analytics story? And the fact that we're now with leveraging NVMe to undercut the value prop of spinning disk in your HPC analytics environments by 5X, that's huge, right? So now let's take nearline SaaS off the table for anything that's actually for data of, of you know, such an analytical value to us. So in simplicity elements, what we're doing now, being able to make our own flash, yeah, we've been uh, deriving from the Texas Memory Systems acquisition uh, eight years ago, and then integrating that into some uh, essentially industry proven software solutions that we do with Inspector Virtualize. Um, that appliance form factor has been absolutely monumental for us in the distributed systems. And thanks for giving us a, a topic to discuss at our socially distant Thanksgiving table. We'll talk about <laughs> IBM. I know now I have great, great fodder for conversation. AJ, over to you, a lot of advances here, also in such uh, dynamic times. 
I want to get your perspective, Brocade's perspective on how you're taking advantage of these latest technologies with IBM. And, and also from a customer's perspective, what are they, are they feeling and really being able to embrace and, and utilize that simplicity that Matt talked about? Right. Yeah. So, so there's a couple things that that fall into that, to be honest. One of which is that similar to what what you heard um, Brian describe across the IBM portfolio for storage, um, in our SAN infrastructure, it's a single operating system up and down the line. So, from the most entry level platform we have to the largest platform we have, it's a single software up and down. It's a single management uh, environment up and down. And it's also intended to be extremely reliable and extremely performant because you know here's here's part of the challenge when when Matt's talking about um, you know multiple petabytes in a two U rack height right the the conversation you want to flip on its head there a little bit is okay exactly how many virtual machines and how many applications are you going to be driving out of that because it's going to be thousands like between six and ten thousand potentially out of that right so imagine then if you have some sort of little hiccup in the connectivity to the data store for 6,000 to 10,000 applications. That's not the kind of thing people get forgiving about, right? You know, you, the, the, when we're all home like this, when we're, when, when, when your healthcare, when your finance, when your entertainment, when, when everything is coming to you across the network and, and remotely in this fashion, you know, and it's all application driven, you know, the one thing that you want to make sure of is, is that network doesn't hiccup because humans have a lot of really good characteristics. Patients would not be one of those. And so, you know, you, you want to make sure that everything is in fact in play and running. And that's, that's one of the things that we work very hard with, with our, our friends at IBM to, to make sure of is that, that um, the kinds of analytics that, that Matt was just describing are things that you can readily get done. It's it, the you know speed is the new currency of business is a is a phrase you hear from a quote you hear from from Mark Benioff at Salesforce right and and he's right you know if you can get data out of you know intelligence out of the data you've been collecting that's really cool but one of the other sort of flip sides on the people not being able to be in the data center and and to Matt's point not as many people um, around either um, is how are humans fast enough when you look when, honestly when you look at the performance of the platforms these folks are putting up how is human response time going to be good enough? And we all sort of have this, this headset of, you know, a network operations center where you've got, you know, a couple dozen people in a half lit room staring at massive screens on the wall. Something to pop, right? Well, okay, if the first time a red light pops, the human begins the investigation, at what point is that going to be good enough? And so our argument for the autonomy piece of, of what we're doing in the, in the fabrics is, you can't wait on the humans. Um, you need to augment it. Yes, you know I, I get that that people still want to be in charge, and that's and that's good. Humans are still smarter than the silicon. We're not as repeatable, um, but 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 we're still so far uh, so far smarter about it. And so, you know, we need it to be able to do that measurement. We need to be able to figure out what normal looks like. We need to be able to highlight to the storage platform and to and to the application admins when things go sideways, because the demand from the applications isn't going to slow down. The demands from your environment, you know, whether you want to think about, you know, take the next steps with with not just your home entertainment, uh, home entertainment systems, but but learning, augmented reality, right? Virtual reality environments for 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 kids, right? How do you make them feel like they're part and parcel of, of the of the classroom? You know, for as long as we have to continue living a modified world and, and perhaps past it, right? You know, if you can if you can take a grade school from, you know, from your local area and give them a virtual walkthrough of the Louvre where everybody's got a perfect view and it all looks incredibly real to them, those are cool things, right? Those are cool applications, right? If you can figure out, you know, a, a new vaccine faster, right? Not a bad thing, right? You know, if, if we can model better, not a bad thing. So we need to enable those things. We need We need to not be the bottleneck which is, you know, you get get Matt and Brian over an adult beverage at some point and ask them about about the cycle time for the silicon they're playing with. We've never had Moore's Law applied external storage before. Never in the history of external storage has that been true until now. And so yeah. their their cycle times, Matt, right? Yeah, you struck a nerve there, AJ, because it's it's pretty simple for us to follow the the linear increase in in capacity and computational horsepower, right? We just ride the x86 bandwagon, ride the, the silicon bandwagon. But what we have to do in order to maintain that simplicity story is follow the more important ones for the resiliency factor, right? Because as we increase the capacity, as we increase the 
the essentially the amount of data responsible for each admin, we have to literally logarithmically increase the resiliency of these boxes. Because we talk about petabyte scale systems and hosting you know, literally 10,000 virtual machines in a two U form factor, I need to be able to accommodate that to make sure things don't blip. I need resilient networks, right? I need to have redundancy and, and access. I need to have protection schemes at every single layer of the stack. And so we're quite happy to be able to provide that, right? As we as we leapfrog the industry and go in, you know, literally situations that are three times the competitive density that what you see out there in other distributed systems that are still bound by the commercial offerings, then hey, we also have to own that risk from a vendor side. We have to make these things essentially rate six protection scheme equivalent from a, from a drive standpoint and active active controllers everywhere be able to supply the performance and consistency uh, of that service throughout even the bad path situations. And, and to that point, one of the things that you talk about that's that's interesting to me that I'd, I'd kind of like you to highlight is your recovery times, right? Because bad things will happen, right? And so you guys do something very, very different about that. That's, that's I, critical to a lot of my customers because they know that Murphy will show up one day <laughs> so the, 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 right. So I mean, because because it happens, right? So then, so then what? Well, speaking yeah. of that, then what, Brian? I want to go over to you. You talk. You mentioned Matt mentioned resiliency, and if we think of the situation that we're in in 2020, you know, many companies are used to DR and BC plans for natural disasters, pandemics. So as we look at the shift, and and then the the volume of ransomware that's gone up. Uh, one ransomware attack every 11 seconds this year right now. How Brian are what's that change that businesses need to make from from cyber security to cyber resiliency? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good point. And, and I try to hammer that home with our clients that, hey, you're, you're used to having your business continuity disaster recovery. This whole cyber resiliency thing is a completely separate practice that we have to set up and think about and go through the same, you know, thought process that you did for your DR. What are you going to do? What are you going to protest? How are you going to, how are you going to you know, test it? How are you going to detect if whether or not you've got ransomware? So I spent a lot of time with our clients on that theme of you have to think about and build your cyber resiliency plan because it's going to happen. It's it's not like a DR plan where it's a pure insurance policy. And when, like you said, 11, every 11 seconds, there's an event that takes place. It's going to be a when, not an if. And, and so, you know, we have to work with our customers to put in a place uh, for cyber resiliency. And then we spent a lot of discussion on, okay, what does that mean? You know, for my critical applications from a restore time, a backup and a mutability, what do we need for, for those types of services, right? In terms of quick restore, which, which are my tier zero applications that I need to get back as fast as possible? You know, what other ones can I, you know, stick out on tape or virtual tape and, 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 and do things like that. So again, there's a wide range of technology that we have available in the, in the portfolio for helping our clients from cyber resiliency. And in, we try to distinguish that cyber resiliency versus cyber security. So how do we, how do we keep every, everybody out from, from a cyber security view? And then what can we do from the cyber resiliency from a, from a storage perspective to help them once, once it gets to us, that's a bad thing. So how can we help, help, help our folks recover? Well, and at the point that you know you're making, Brian, is that now it's not a matter of could this happen to us? It's going to. How much can we tolerate? But ultimately, we have to be able to recover. If we can't restore that data, then you know, you know, and one of those things when you talk about ransomware and things, we we go to that people as the weakest link in security. AJ talked about that. There's the people. Yeah, there's probably quite a bit of lack of patience going on right now. But as we look at, AJ, I want to go back over to you to kind of look at from a data center perspective and these storage solutions being able to utilize things to help the people. AI, machine learning, you talked about uh, AR, VR. Talk to me a little bit more about that as you see, say in the next you know, 12 months or so as moving forward, these trends, these new solutions that are simplified. Yeah, so a um, couple of things around that. One of which is, um, this this iteration of of technology, you know, the 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 storage platforms, you know, the silicon they're making use of. And Matt, I think you you told me fourteen months is the is is roughly the the silicon cycle that you you guys are seeing, right? So, performance levels are going to continue to go up. The the speeds the speeds are going to continue to go up. 
the scale is going to is going to continue to shift. And one of the things that 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 does for a lot of the application owners is it lets them think broader. It lets them think bigger. And I, and I wish I could tell you that I knew what the next big application was going to be, but then we'd be having a conversation about which island in the Pacific I was going to be retiring to, right? <laughs> so, but 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 they're going to come. And they're going to they're going to consume this performance because if you look at the applications that you're dealing with in your everyday life, right? You know they continue to get broader. The scope of them continues to to, to scale out, right? There's things that we do. You know, I saw I saw a um, I think it was an MIT development recently where they're they're talking about being able to, and they were originally doing it for Alzheimer's, but uh, and dementia, but they're they're talking about being able to use the microphones in your smartphone to listen to the way you cough and use that as a predictor for people who have COVID that are not symptomatic yet. So asymptomatic COVID people, right? So when we start talking about where this where this kind of technology can go and where it can lead us, right? The, there's sort of this unending possibility for it. But what that depends on in part is that the infrastructure has to be extremely sound, right? The foundation has to be there. We, we have to have the, the resilience, the reliability. And, and, you know, one of the points that Brian was just making you know, is is extremely key. You know, we we talk about disaster tolerance, right? And, and you know, business continuance. Well, business continuance is how do you recover? Cyber resilience is the same conversation, right? It, you know, so you have the protection side of it. You know, here's my here's my defenses. Now, what happens when they actually get in, right? And you know, let's let's be honest, right? Humans are frequently that weak link, right? For a variety of behaviors that that, that humans that humans have. Um, and so when when that happens, you know, where's the where's the software in the storage that tells you, hey, wait, there's an odd traffic behavior here where data is being copied, you know, at rates and to locations that that are not normal, right? And so that's part of when we talk about what we're doing in our side of the automation is how do you know what normal looks like? And once you know what normal looks like, you can figure out where the outliers are. And that's one of the things that that people use a lot for trying to determine whether or not ransomware is going on is, hey, um, this is a traffic pattern that's new. This is a traffic pattern that's that's different. And, you know, are they doing this because they're copying the data set from here to here and encrypting it as they go, right? Because that's, you know, one of the, you know, one of the challenges you gotta, you gotta watch for. So I think you're gonna see a lot of advancement in the application space. You're gonna, you know, and, and not just the, the MIT stuff, which is, which is great. You know, the, the fact that people are actually able or I, I may have misspoken. It may have been Johns Hopkins, and I apologize to the Johns Hopkins folks if it was. But you know that that kind of scenario, right? It's, there's no knowing what they can um, make use of here in terms of the data sets, right? Because we're we're gathering so much data. You know, the the Internet of Things is an overused phrase, but the the sheer volume of data that's being generated outside of the data center, but manipulated, analyzed, and stored internally. Right, because you got to have it someplace secure, right? And you know that's that's one of the things that we look at from our side is we've we've got to be that you know as close to unbreakable as we can be, and then when things do break, able to figure out exactly what what happened as rapidly as possible, um, and then the recovery cycle as well. Excellent, and Matt, I want to finish with you. We just have a few seconds left, but as we as AJ was talking about this massive evolution in applications, for example, and we talk about simplicity, and we talk about resiliency and being able to recover when something happens. How do these new technologies that we've been unpacking today, how do these help the admin folks deal with all of the dynamics that are happening today? Yeah, so I, I think the, the biggest uh, drop the mic thing we can say right now is that we're delivering 100% tier zero NVMe without data reduction value props on top of it at a cost that undercuts off-prem S3 storage. So if you look at what you could do from an off-prem solution for air gap and run cyber resiliency, you can put your data somewhere else and it's going to take whatever long time to transfer the data back on-prem to get back to your recover point. But when you work at economics that we're doing right now in distributed systems, hey, your DR side, your copies of data do not have to wait for that off-prem bandwidth to restore. You can actually literally restore in place. And you couple that with all of the, the technology on the software side that integrates with it, I get incremental point in time recoveries, either it's on the primary side, a DR side, wherever. But the fact that we get to approach this thing from a cost value, then by all means, I can naturally absorb a lot of the cyber resiliency value in that too. And because it's all, again, all the same orchestrated capabilities, regardless of it's big, small, medium, 
uh, all that stuff rise the same skill sets. And so yeah, I don't need to really learn new platforms or new solutions to providing cyber resiliency. It's just part of my day-to-day -day activity because fundamentally all of us have to wear that cyber resiliency hat. But as, as our job as a vendor is to make that simple, make it cost elegance and be able to provide a essentially homogenous solutions overall. So, hey, as your business grows, your risk gets averted and your recovery means also get uh, thwarted <laughs> essentially by, the, by, your, by your incumbent solutions and architectures. So it's pretty cool stuff what we're doing right now. It is pretty cool. And I'd say a lot of folks would say that's the nirvana, but I think the message that the three of you have given in the last 20 minutes or so is that IBM and Brocade together, this is a reality. You guys are a cornucopia of knowledge. Brian, Matt, AJ, thank you so much for joining me on this panel. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you again, Lisa. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. My pleasure. For my guests, I'm Lisa Martin. You've been watching this IBM Brocade panel on theCUBE.